Normally I wait for questions because I'm actually here for you, of course. So you ask questions, you tell me how you felt with the film. I might want to begin with this film because I'm actually used to this mood in the audience with War Photographer. It's kind of a hard film now. So maybe I can begin with telling you a little bit about the importance of this idea of the micro cameras, which is of course not a technical little schnickschnack. Eh? It is very essential. Because if you want to cover the work of somebody who is seeking for authentic moments himself, you know, the decisive moment, you know, this important term in photography when they reached out with their Leica cameras, street photography, and you try to capture the real life and you try to be invisible. So if, if you surround the photographer like Jim Nachtway with a normal film crew, you don't get anything. You can do it with Helmut Newton, you can do it with all the other photographers, with the studios and the stage and the models. So they know one more camera doesn't matter, you know, it's no... But there was no film actually about this kind of photography before I did War Photographer, which tried to really cover the way these kind of photos are being captured. So. You know, now we are in times of GoPro cameras. Everybody has a GoPro camera. I hate the texture of the GoPro, by the way. I, I don't like the texture. I like this old-fashioned texture of these micro cameras we had to use. It's 20 years ago, huh? don't forget that. It was uh, still um, not possible to grab uh, the signal uh, digitally. It was a little DV cam tape machines in his backpack. It was a very sophisticated equipment we had to build. It was kind of done in a Swiss watchmaker tradition, very carefully. Because the deal with Mr. Nakhtoy was a very simple one. He told me, and it's true, it's not a legend, you destroy one of my photos and you're out. Okay? So uh, that was the deal. The contract he signed two weeks before we went to the Oscars. I mean, you know, the agreement. So our agreement was, you are allowed to be close to me, which I actually hate, of course, because I know the power of the lens. I hate to be exposed. I hate to have a lens uh, come from the, my, myself and my work. But I allow you to be at least somehow close to me, but you don't destroy one of my photos. He's a, he was a difficult protagonist, of course. But the key idea of getting close to him and getting his approval was of course the micro camera idea because at least that made him being interested in me you know there was other attempts to do a film on the on this famous photographer uh, before but they didn't succeed because he normally for example he he never tells you that he's going somewhere you have to find out yourself like veramala you know i found out oh there's an intifada happening I called a friend of mine in Tel Aviv. She's a producer. Where are the photographers normally in which hotel? Oh, they are in American Colony Hotel in East Jerusalem. I called there and they told me he's there. He, he signed in and I just went there. And he wasn't even surprised that I show up. That's my job. He was not friendly. He was not inviting, but he was also the best protagonist you can have as a documentarist because he didn't do anything because of the camera. Straight forward. That's our stars, you know, the ones who don't change. They don't go to the hairdresser. Is it, is it okay like that? If I sit like that, then you are already lost. You can just, you know, kill yourself. I mean, no, I mean, it's just, he was difficult, but he was also incredible strong in a way that, yeah, we discovered yeah, he is a great protagonist, but he's really difficult. He tried to escape several times. And um, he had to learn that I'm stubborn too. And I learned about stubbornness from him. He's really um, in his work, you know. So the micro cameras were essential, of course. It's, uh, it's like the basic idea of trying to cover a photographer's work. And my cinematographer, Peter, he could have like a distance of at least four meters. And that makes a big difference with, with the people because they, they, 
they were in contact in relation to Nachtwey with his photo still camera, but we were just a little bit not really important anymore. Okay. So shoot. Yes, thank you. Well, it's 20 years now. He was, again, you know, he was difficult. He watched the film, of course, and he, he cried. I was sending uh, my assistant out of the room, and we, yeah, we need like half an hour to, I mean, it was big for him. It is a cathartic thing because, you know, when we started, people doing the work like him were accused of being war pornographers. That was the time of this famous article where, because they, I mean, they can deal with criticism. I think it's important. If you do this kind of work, you want the debate, you, it's fine. But the criticism was that you come back from Rwanda, where 800,000 people have been murdered by their neighbors with machetes and killed in churches and, you know, and you try to photograph this genocide and this in, the, the unspeakable. And then you're coming home and you read an article saying that you're actually getting excited, almost sexually excited by these bodies. It's too much. I mean, he couldn't deal with that. And he was really, that was just coming out when we started working together. And he was really like, because it, there was kind of a market of, I'm sorry to say it in these words, but there were some less gifted photographers in the field. And they were holding their cameras on the, like, let's take Kosovo, there's a crying woman on the floor. And you had this ugly picture of three photographers, you know, surrounding this poor woman. But if you are in a war, then, I mean, this, this crying woman, she didn't cry because of the photographers. Maybe, you know, she suffered uh, ethnic cleansing or she saw her daughter being raped. That is her emotion. So it's the problem is not the photographers, but these photos did sell well. You know, it was the time of everybody. When I started the film, people already knew how the film will be. They have seen, they, they saw all these fiction films where photographers, combat photographers were depicted as very cynical guys going to the same brothels. It's in the film, you know, and kind of exploiting with vampires with their camera, exploiting the misery of other people. That's was the expect expectation of the people giving me the money. They already knew, everybody seemed to know exactly what is this character. And it's also interesting because I gave them, when I, when I, when I wrote the treatment in order to get the money, I, ga I gave them this cynicism. I made them an offer they couldn't refuse. So I gave them all this shit and I made the film as I wanted. It's actually a little tip for, the, for you, you know, just don't go against the energy, go with it. And then please, then do your film like you want to do it. But it was really, um, for Jim, it was very difficult to, to work with us, with Peter and me. Peter Indigan, my cinematographer, was actually a very big help because for Jim, it was easier to connect with Peter, you know, the, 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 the two guys with the camera, and they began to respect each other. Well, I mean, it was, it was full of conflict. It's not in the film, because I, con I don't consider that so important. It's just normal, you know. It's part of our work, but it's not the topic of the film. So he, I mean, now, of course, it's his film. You know, that's the answer, short answer to your, he's, he's it, the film is everywhere, and it's okay, but... Uh, also, you know, when, when you deal with a photographer, I had to find also an, an, a simple deal in terms of money with him. And I think there I was kind of clever because I didn't have so much funding for this film. I mean, I was not known yet at all. And what I promised to Jim, and he had a Fifth Avenue lawyer, you know, this kind of $550 per hour and all these, you know, platin CDs of the of the wrappers on the on the walls and the, the carpets you sink in and and of course this lawyer was asking me about my lawyer and I said no, you know, don't have a lawyer. You have to deal with me, and I make you a very simple offer. Jim will get fifty percent of the of the of the of the cross income uh, of U.S. Uh, deals, and we didn't know that we will do uh, a big deal. Uh, 
in US, so that, but he was, he agreed with that. But I couldn't hide behind, I still have, you know, deaths and I still, I, I, it was from the, from the top 50% US. And I think I gave him $20,000 for at least it's 26 minutes of his work. So also I tried to, to have a very simple relationship also in, in legal terms with him because the lawyer, of course, wanted to do the contrary. He told, <laughs> I remember this, this meeting, the lawyer, I mean, Jim's lawyer saying, well, he's like an actor. You tell him what to do. So you have to insurance him in a war zone, imagine. I mean, so it's, you know, the, I'm so slow because it's, you cannot do a work like this without just being for days and weeks working on your own and being really carefully analyzing every situation. Like every single conversation with Jim, I grabbed it somehow on tape and I, I did a transcript just to know. I mean, because he, he gave me some time, but not so much. And that was actually good because I, I knew very well what he told me. And it was kind of a, it's just the way you have to work with these kind of people. Probably with other protagonists, you don't have to work like that. But with him, it was, it was very good because he, he really tried to escape several times just to... Uh, he told me at the end uh, that I made it difficult for you, his words, because it was difficult for me. That's, you know, that's the thing. How did you meet him or how did you decide uh, to <clears throat> make a film about him? That's one question. And the other is, how long did you follow him? Yeah. So I, I have that in my career. I have these moments in my life when I have a, an epiphany, you understand this word in English? I have to sit down immediately because I know this is the next four years of my life. I just realize it. I, and then when I bite into this bone, I don't let it go. But it's a very strong moment. And I had it with a uh, war photographer when I was in a plane heading to Chicago. It was a, it was a Latino film festival with Ricardo Miremi Fidel. And I was buying a Stern magazine. The magazine is now in the film. And they featured like 12 double pages with black and white photographs of Kabul and Afghanistan war. And I looked at these photos, you know, impressed, of course. I read the article written by um, Mr. Klare. He's also in the film, this German journalist, describing this guy with his, you know, iron jeans and his white shirt, almost Zen Buddhist, uh, very different from the stereotype uh, um, how photographers or war photographers are. And I knew this is, this is my f second feature length documentary. And I already had the idea of the micro cameras in the same plane because I experienced a lot with photography myself and I was a teenager. And I could just feel this is the right approach, you know, with, with tiny video cameras and you... And then first I had the idea of looking through his lens, actually, which would have meant that we build it into the photo camera, which would have been a very bad idea. Look at the sulfur mine. Four Canon cameras being just, you know, broken. The very, very corrosive gas. So that didn't work. And uh, it's much better because now you see the triggering. I think that's, you shoot back. You shoot ex against the war. You, you, you try to stop wars by shooting back, you know. I mean, like a, so I had this epiphany in the plane and then, <laughs> yeah, my excitement and everything, but it didn't really help because he didn't answer for six months. I'm not kidding. That was the time before email, so it was faxes. It was pounding hard, uh, delivering messages to his uh, answering machine, which you can't delete, <laughs> you know. You, <laughs> you <laughs> and later on, I found out he was, he was working on a fiction script about um, his life for Disney. Big Mouse was involved. <laughs> and they bought the life story rights already from this guy, which made it a little bit then um, complex with my contract, but okay. You know, small Swiss documentaries. I mean, no, I'm not known and big mouths. But 
finally he reacted just, I think, to politely tell me that it's not possible to do a film like he told others before because you cannot approach me and it's too dangerous and actually blah, blah, blah. And I told him about the micro cameras and he reacted. Now I, I lost your second one. Oh, okay. Well, you know, we couldn't plan, of course, uh, very well how long we will be shooting because we didn't know about which wars we will be covering. Uh, it was finally two years. And it's also interesting because, for example, let's take this very important sequence in St at Stern magazine when they actually handle this, his photographs and they use a language, I hope it was well translated in Spanish, you know, oh, it looks nice, you know, the pile of corpses. And this was very important and, as you have seen in the film, I used this kind of cuts from the field directly. So, and now you could think, well, this was just shot for the film. Of course not. You would never get that. This atmosphere, it has to be real. That meant Stern magazine is a huge German magazine. They had to do it, you know. They had to do a piece uh, again with Mr. Nachtway. And I shot that as the last thing. Adam, the film was already born on the editing table. And I shot that and I knew exactly what I wanted then. And something else uh, happened also in Hamburg, which was very nice and a gift from reality. That's Christiane Breustedt, the only woman in his life who really, eye level, really involvement. He was, I mean, he always had girlfriends. He's a handsome guy. I got hundreds of emails myself addressed to him, of course, you know. But, uh, he's fascinating for women if they have this kind of um, nurse <laughs> attitude. But Christiane was a real, she was real. She was challenging. And I met her, I realized I want her in the film and not the actual Japanese girlfriend he had at the time. Another decision, huh? <laughs> and she told me then also in Hamburg, I think he wrote a very important text once when he was very young and starting his career in middle America, Nicaragua. Why photograph war? I think I have it somewhere because he didn't have it, he didn't even... No, he didn't have it. He gave it to her. And she was uh, seeking for this text for, like, she told me two days. I don't know if it's true, but I think she really wanted to find it in the, I don't know where, but she had to go through all this stuff. And she found it. And that was, of course, also another key moment for me in the main storytelling. Because at a certain moment, I found out, well, what is the main question in this film? The main question is, how can you, how, how, dare you to go that close to this crying woman. That's a very important sequence. We also tested it very carefully because we didn't want people to, to leave the studio or the, the, you know, the, the movie theater because it's really hard to watch. But this is like the main big question mark at the beginning of this film. How dare you? And then, you know, to give him this why photograph war as a, like a credo, like really giving him the opportunity to say it again. Now, the, the film was also criticized by some professionals at the beginning. It has at least three endings. It's true. You shouldn't have it. You should have one ending. And, I mean, I remember my world sales, um, you know, Jan Riffekamp is the best. I mean, he, 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 he dropped me a, a long email. We have an issue with the endings. Everybody's telling me you have three endings. And I was like, yeah. It's true. So, so, <laughs> yeah. I didn't change anything. Yeah. I think, yeah, or... Um, could you please talk about the editing process? Yes. You edited yourself. That's um, All my films are edited by myself. That's why I'm so slow. I do one film every four years. That's how I make a living. I just love editing too much. Also, but I mean, the filmmakers among you, I, this is not a recipe to success. So it's very important. It's a very good statement that you're being told by producers and in film schools that it's not a good idea to edit yourself. 
So if I'm saying you the contrary, don't take that as a recipe. It's just, I love it too much. And by the way, I'm not sitting alone in the editing room. I have an assistant. But th that means an assist she's now a famous filmmaker herself. The assistant I had in Four Photography, she did hashtag female pleasure about female sexuality and the five religions, uh, so, you know, suppressing female sexuality. So I'm proud of her. You learn a lot in an editing room. Actually, that's a place to learn. In a, because there's not this cable shit and the catering, like the shooting stuff, uh, this artistic thing. No, oh, they're shooting a film. It's, the, it's, it's a real room of truth. You know, you're, you're kind of naked in there in the sense of it's not looking good at the, at the beginning. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not perfect. There's no, no room for narcissism in there. But then you go through this process. And... Another important thing is, of course, I, I, I'm now doing it with all my films. I never do shooting period and then editing period afterwards. Never, ever, in none of my films. I begin to shoot and then I begin to edit immediately. I mean, this made sense here, you know. Kosovo was done, you know. Kosovo, the Balkans, we went there, we shot, and I came home with the footage. That's what we have. So I begin to edit and I begin to test screen it also very early in stages of 20, 30 minutes of footage. So people tell you, I don't understand this and this and this, and that's okay, of course not. But they also tell you, I get this feeling out of it, I, I wonder how this is, this is how I react, and etc. You begin to communicate. So the test screenings are an important tool for me, and also, of course, supervising editors. Sometimes, um, many of them I, are never in the end credits because they're too famous. But I, it, finally, I also do it now myself for other films. It's so easy, you know, when you have this, I wouldn't say rough cuts, but this like 110 minute, almost final cut stuff, and then you give it to a pro, and then they tell you, so easy, it's so obvious what you see, you know, if you're not cold like a fish, what you get, of course, in the editing room, you don't hear it, you're, it's nothing anymore, you, you begin to do jokes on the wrong, I mean, you need to put on glasses in the sense you put, you bring into the editing room other people and then you begin, I, when I do a test screening, I, I just, I, of course, I don't watch the film, I watch people watching. And if it's not a comedy, it's hard to see because they, you cannot count uh, laughing. You know, a comedy is much easier. Then you can, um, you can even do a list. Is this laugh coming? Is this laugh coming? Is this laugh coming? But here you can see it. You know, if it's if it's if it's working or not. And editing means bringing footage to life. That's how I see it. Because this here, a movie theater, is about an experience. It's not about information, first of all. So it, at, at a certain point, this, this thing begins to be alive. I don't know. It's hard to describe, because my films are not all the same, but I think this is what I uh, can tell you. Yeah. Throughout the film, you can see um, like concept decisions made by the director, like the video camera, and also on po um, post production, on the editing, you see another uh, like directorial decisions. But during filming on these war zones, did you have like any tools or um, any space for, let's say, creative process, or you just like went along and got all the footage you could? It's a good question. It's a mix. No, it's not a mix. Actually, um, now the basic creative decisions have been done. So it's, of course, not only the micro cameras. As you have seen, every other protagonist, I call them also protagonists, in the film is not just a speaking head. Because, you know, naturally it was known. So I could have done the American style with a maybe neutral background and, and use a lot of names and they add some information about this guy. I didn't want that. That was a decision I made. I did not know that I will get Christiane Amonpour in Kosovo. And this is, was because I had the best car. 
because I came from Switzerland with a Nissan Patrol, with a satellite dish on the, on the roof, with nice Swiss chocolate, a whole range of drugs, and I mean drugs, you know, that you can treat yourself, and we had everything in this car, and she liked to use it. So I got her into it, but then I knew, I asked her that I want also her to be at least for one day the protagonist. That was essential. It's all, all, every protagonist here has its own life. Nobody is just coming into the film per, you know, like as an interview person. And that's important. And this ride, for example, this cowboy in Jakarta, he's so important because it's a side Nakhtwe doesn't want to show too much, the adventure side, you know, the cool guy with the camera. And also I like this because this one moment he's, Telling about the lynching is the worst situation you can ever imagine. And my panic was along the two years that we will get into this situation where you have to have the fear that actually you add to the violence or even to killing because you are filming or taking photos. The, I mean, blah, you know, so... I think I had an, an understanding. We knew uh, from the beginning we will have this right because I went to Jakarta. We, we, we did expect much more violence actually in Jakarta. You know, it's now, for example, again, you know, lynching and, and it is normal there. You know, they kill the Christian Chinese minority. But so we knew, I, I knew I will have this right as a protagonist. And then he's also, you know, friend from the youth and uh, scriptwriter. And Hans Hermann Klare too. They were, because I, I like this guy also because he was a colleague and, and he wrote the article and, and, and we started. So this was another part of the concept which was already done. What else can you, you know, that's it. I mean, basically. And the rest was, trying to survive Jim. I mean, that was a difficult marriage. A one-sided love. <laughs> yeah, it is some, and you can compare it to love because this is how I see my protagonist. It's like literally falling in love. It means the universe of this other person gets very important for me. Like when you're in love, you know, you're constantly ruminating about this uh, person. And it can be as frustrating as love is. By the way, I'm showing Sleepless in New York on, I think on Friday, the biggest battlefield I ever entered. I tried to do a film on love also. So, uh, yeah. But I think we're fine. Okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, yes, sure, I'm sorry. I'm not the director here, Mr. Fry. Um, how was the process with Eleni, the musician? Well, um, she likes my films. Uh, it's never a process. I mean, I'm, I, music is another thing I can talk a long time about it. It's very essential. Music is something I don't put like the cream on the cake. I put it as the main ingredients into the cake. That means I make music decisions in the very early stage of writing and even before I shoot. It's true. But it's never music I let, it's not composed for me. It, I just license it. So this is music she wrote. Um, um, she's Greece, you know, from Greek and from Northern Greek and she's a wonderful um, composer. And this is, um, I'm, what was the film she did it for? I, I don't remember, but it was already composed. So I work for, you know, with, with big names like Arvo Pert, uh, Philip Glass, but it's always licensed. Now Max Richter. He was almost killing me. I mean, my budget. <laughs> the, prob the problem is with these this, this musicians, they get really expensive now because um, they, they don't make any more money with CDs and stuff. So they... Okay. Ah, Angelopoulos. It's the Angelopoulos film she did. Mm -hmm. The journey of the day, no? Exactly. This is not in my ear, huh? This sound, no? Okay. <laughs> not that old yet. So try to stop it then. Okay, shoot. 
Yes. Uh, what did you learn as a film director from James Natchley? A lot. I learned a lot from him. I mean, you can imagine. Because, of course, you know, documentary filmmaking and documentary photography, if you want, you know, street photography, it's somehow similar. I mean, this, you know, when... I mean, when we try to do direct cinema, purely observational style, I mean, we learn from these guys. I mean, you have seen it now in the film, the, the, the contract between him and these people, without words, you know? He's using almost this Indian language, you know, like, hi. But, I mean, he's really... Because it's all about body language, you know? If some guy would now come in from a local newspaper and he would just, you know bragging with his camera and getting in. I mean, it's it, the way you appear in real situations with your crew, it's being read. So you better put your, you know, camera sizes and all the stuff you use, you better downplay this stuff, for example. And you better just wait also. He's sometimes waiting for a long time before he, I think if he would, ha if he would, take photos here now, he will probably sit somewhere. And at a certain moment, when maybe when I'm getting whatever furious or something, then he would take some photos, but not from the beginning. It is, it's, it's, it's a, such an important difference between, you know, in fiction you have this narcissism, you know, oh, trailers, oh, crew, oh, catering. And actually, the magic, I think, of good fiction directors is to play this down, too, with their actors. Because in the core, a good fiction film is a documentary on authentic moments of actors. What else? And some of these moments, even in the biggest films, are shot by when the whole crew is leaving the room, there's a DOP cinematographer left and the director, and the actors begin to... And they don't have too many marks on the floor. They are still free. The light is done in a way that they can move documentary. So, you know, it's important because when I began filmmaking, I, I, I never did a film school. I, <laughs> they didn't want me. It's okay. Uh, I teach now there. <laughs> Fassbinder was before me, also rejected. Um, I learned by doing like 100 films for a big company in Basel, in Switzerland. Uh, it's now called Novartis. And I did a lot of little small documentaries about, you know, they wanted to show in these little documentaries what they do in pharmaceutical research, et cetera, et cetera. And I've, I was young, you know, your age, and I had the budget. Seven lighting men, little trailer, big camera, cables, cranes, dolly. <laughs> And I remember at a certain moment, actually I realized it myself, how much I'm destroying the beauty of these real people in these real situations by putting marks and all this bullshit. And what you end up is this nice lighting, nice cover movement and nothing, really nothing in it. Empty, zero, you, you killed it. So when I'm now going to shoot with, with Peter, I mean, you should see us. We look like two TV guys. We also, I'm also hiding all this be between Swiss TV because it's much easier to go to these uh, countries as a TV guy. And then it's uh, every cable is just one little cable and nothing, you know, no. And it's beautiful. I did it, you know, I had it with the narcissism, with the cables. Oh, we're doing a film here. So actually, it's about the beauty now of what we get on the footage, the moments, the emotions, the real conflicts, you know. That makes me now excited. And I constantly now downplay the the size of the camera. And you can choose now. And it's really, uh, you know, it's funny. With your generation, you're doing, of course, the same mistakes. You might have the li this little photo still camera, Canon, whatever, and then a rigging around it, which makes it so looking like a monster. Again, you can use the biggest camera on, on the market anyway. And then, you know, the boom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you hardly see it in my filming. It's just, you know, flying dogs. I spoke once with a cinematographer. He was doing a film in in Tibet, and they were just shooting nicely the yaks, you know, these nice animals. 
and he was the cinematographer, he's a very good one. And the sound guy wanted to do a good job too, so he made the flying dog like four meters, you know, with the boom, you know. And of course the yaks were all running away. <laughs> and that made the cinematographer quite angry because what's the sound here, you know? So, you know, I mean, I'm very difficult with sound guys because I let them know very respectfully, you are second. And re you really are. I mean, when you watch Genesis 2.0 on Sunday, you know, I, first time I had a co-director, they were shooting on a very remote island. It was full of wind. It, they're young. They didn't... It's a problem that this generation is not so good in sound. We couldn't use really the sound. So it's all Foley now and, and really two weeks of Foley artists for a documentary that's long. So you can fix sound, as you all know now, with these nice programs you have. Huh? With this, we didn't have it that time yet. We were fighting a tank here in War Photographer for two days. I mean, the sound of it. Without this nice uh, instrument, you know. But you can fix it. What you can't fix is, is uh, when the reacts are running away, they're running away. So, I mean, not, with War Photographer, I did sound myself. I just had this little wireless and we used the Betacam, Digi Betacam, with four channels, that's it. So what you saw is Peter Indegam, my cinematographer, with a, quite a big camera, because I, it doesn't look more extreme than you with your little cameras and the grotesque rigging around it. It was a big camera and it had already the sound in and I was 20, 30 meters away. I, so many scenes in my films have been shot by one guy alone. And that, of course, important. You don't destroy the real emotions, or at least much less. The beauty of direct cinema. I still believe in it. Even though in, in film school, I know they tell you that, yes, of course, the, you know, uh, the presence of the camera of an observer is changing reality. And then they come with quantum physics. <laughs> Because when you observe, it changes. Give me a break. It works. It does. You can also criticize me, huh, by the <laughs> way. Don't make me be too comfortable here. <laughs> well, I'm going to do that. All I right. just want to Thank know you. how much of the character moral issues you have yourself. I mean, why do we have to photography war and see like so many people suffering? How do you deal with that? And do you think it's necessary nowadays after making this film? Oh yeah, I mean, this is easy to answer, believe me. I believe in, in this film, I believe in the work of all these photographers. You might think what Jim Nakwe is dreaming of, of kind of fighting violence with shooting back, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't think so. I still feel it's very important. But there is, of course, in the core, something which is really, we have to know about it as storytellers. And this is the grim satisfaction when something bad is happening in front of the camera because this is your topic. Let's take another co topic out of war photography. If you do domestic violence, it's an important topic, no? And to try to go to approach, you know, couples where they, this could happen. I mean, so what's your situation now? Because of you, they're just nice with each other. And you saw and you had this conversation with the woman and she was beaten up heavily. I'm taking this example because I can, I can also define the limits, you know. But you know what I mean? You, are, you can't do your film, you can't raise awareness of the problem of, of violence, domestic violence, if you, don't, if you decide to do it in this way. Uh, if you don't have it. But then, of course, if it happens that it's too much, then it's also you, you have to interfere. And that's the point, you see? I mean, that's why I was so horrified that something could happen like in Jakarta, a lynching. 
because then you're not just guest anymore, you know. So this was, but it never happened actually. So I think it's it's really important if if we we are not bad people if we hope since this is our topic that it's actually showing in the footage. But there is of course a limit, like you know. But therefore, there's heavy debates among us, you know, documentary filmmakers about, because just like a father slapping his kid, for me, this is not too much. I mean, it's still not, you know, but for, for others, it's, it's already, you should intervene. You cannot just film that. Well, this is up to us, you know, but uh, normally our films, our creative documentaries, they also show ourselves, our decisions in it. You know, you are... In every frame of your film, you're also yourself, even though you're not appearing in, personally in the film, but you express yourself through the way you do the film. So you're free to do whatever decision you want to make, but this is, this is the core of it. If everybody is having a good time, you don't have drama, you have, don't have gasoline for, for a story, you don't have a film. If two people say yes at the wedding, it's a private video. As simple as that. Uh, how did you deal with being at a war zone? Because you're not a war photographer. You have no, to I'm do Swiss. It. I mean, we didn't have a war for <laughs> exactly. 150 years. I mean, <laughs> that my, my problem is I live in an overprotected, overinsurance, too rich. No, I had to learn everything. I had no idea about this whole thing, you know. But I mean, on the other hand, I, I tell you how I prepared, you know, not only that I had a good car so I could feel at least safe with this Nissan Patro, which was really a, a very good car and we had the advantage of going from Switzerland to the Balkans with our own car. But I took a class, like a master class, three days in, um, in Phnom Penh about booby traps and landmines and personal, anti-personal mines. So I learned everything about the danger of this stuff because it was everywhere in, in Kosovo, there were the landmines. And I had to protect my, my brother, my cinematographer, Peter, you know, he has a kid and I wanted to bring him back alive. So I learned everything really from the scratch. What, what, how do they look, you know, this uh, anti-personal mines, they look very cheap because they are produced for $2. It looks like uh, an armed, uh, you know, these little things you put in the household to to chase the ants away. It's, it looks like nothing. You, ha you have to learn these things. And then you have to forget about all fiction films you ever saw about wars because this is all bullshit. It's not an adventure. It's boring sometimes. It's a stench of of something very... I don't know, it's so different from any of this adventure stuff. And this, of course, I was very ready to learn, you know, that you hang around, that you, there's nothing happening. That's also reality of it. You have to deal with that too. You know, when we were in Jakarta, it was really no violence. And then, of course, it was really great that James Nakhve decided to do work on poverty which he considers to be a form of violence, and he's, he's right. So we did work with, with, with you know, in this, in this so-called, in these shaft, shacks they put uh, along the railroad tracks, you know, these railroad um, people. And that's another example how difficult it was, because Jim in Jakarta, he disappeared for four entire days. That meant I was in the hotel with my cinematographer, with Peter, and he was gone every morning with no message. Four days, that's a long time. I had no idea what he's doing. And we began to be rather desperate because we began to doubt that we ever get a film out of this. We began to joke that it's like a film you do on, a cell, you know, on these rare animals. So you have to use a long lens and uh, even uh, like a Yeti, you know, at least if it's a, somehow an image of him, you have an image of him, I mean. <laughs> It was rather desperate talks with, with Peter. He came back after four days and we realized why he was away because he was seeking for Sumarno, this guy, handicapped guy uh, who lost his leg and his arm. Because what's the, what was the problem? When we 
went to this um, railroad people community. It's an entire community. There's a lot that, you know, some send their kids to school. It's an entire village is among these railroad trucks. But the problem is it's in the middle of, of Manila also, but in this case, Jakarta. So it's even a touristic place. Tourists visit it. And what's happening? They ask for money. I mean, you know, they're right. And, and, and this is something Jim cannot handle. You know, it's, it's destroying immediately the relationship so he just went away after half an hour. And he was then looking for Sumarno because he wanted to feature one of these guys who is not, you know, like eye level. And he found him and, I mean, the result now is some of these photos are still in the main exhibits, um, not the exhibit, and we were with him. That's great because it's a long career, you know. And it's also an example of these rare situa situations where he's actually having an, a concrete impact with his photos. That was the last issue of Life magazine with Sumarno and his story, and people wanted to donate uh, money. So um, that was, became also difficult because uh, Sumarno is a fragile man and uh, he couldn't handle the money, but then uh, Jim gave it to, to the, his his wife, and then it worked. And the Swiss ambassador in Jakarta invited Sumano and his family three times since then, because he told me that I built a bridge between him as an ambassador and people he would never, ever even, you know, communicate, because what you do in Jakarta, you put your dark windows up because they are at the crossings and they beg, you know, you, you distance yourself. And this is, I think, the beauty of our work. We can create these bridges, you know, to people with totally different concepts, uh, you know, at the edge of society. I would like to ask you uh, your opinion about a film that uh, it's has some point in contact with this. It's uh, The Salt of the Earth about uh, Sebastião Salgado. I met um, Jim a few months ago in Paris here at the opening of his exhibit and Sebastião was also there. And it was interesting to see them. They're big friends. They're very different in character. Sebastiao has everything Jim doesn't have. I mean, they're both very successful, of course, legends. But Salgado has a family, a real life, handicapped kid, trees planting, you know, all this. I mean, Jim is really in, in a more dangerous zone of just committing everything to his work. Can be dangerous. And I, what made me very happy in Paris that I think Jim changed a little bit, a little bit, huh? not too much, but a little bit. He takes some vacations. He got a little bit drunk that evening. We were just 20 people. He never, you know, he was one of these guys. He, he just nips on a little bit of the wine because it's, you know, social thing. And then he gets up as the first one in the morning. I mean, that's all true, you know, four o'clock and he's gone. Third, 365 days of working, just, you know, tunnel, tunnel, tunnel. Well, Wim Wenders, um, I had also dinner with Wim and Jim <laughs> in, in Dresden, because Wenders did the Laudatio for Nacho when he got a um, Peace Award. And you can Google it, if you Google warphotographer.com, you'll find a very beautiful text in English and German. Uh, from written by Wim Wenders about Nachtwey's work. So he, he was watching before he did um, The Salt of the Earth uh, many times, of course, also war photographer. And it's a brilliant film. It's very different, but I think it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Looking back to your life, how do you see Christian Fry changing in these uh, six films through, through these six films? 
how's, how has been Christian Fry <laughs> uh, change? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> well, I, what I can answer you is, for example, when I, at a certain moment in my career, I had to do Sleepless in New York, something else, because I, I, I actually, I never think that I'm trying to repeat myself, but journalists began to write like, oh, he's going to the difficult places and the remote and adventure and stuff like that. So I had to do Sleepless in New York like something in a totally different direction. But many people now say it's the same thing. It's just about love, you know. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, woof, what a personal question. I mean, I'm as much dedicated to my work as Jim, but a little bit less. I still think I have more... I'm enjoying life a little bit more. I like my job, but it's also, of course, not always just an easy thing. You know, what, what, what changed in my career is I got quite known. This is not only an advantage. Uh, in Switzerland, there's also, you know, it's a small country, there's jealousy, it's a, it's a, it can be a problem. And what I can feel also is sometimes, of course, that I'm kind of picky now with my decisions about the next project. As you can imagine, it's the thin air of success. And so it's not any, the ideas are coming constantly, but I'm not very easily to convince myself this is actually really a next film. But that's okay, I can live with it. I still love my job because I love to do more than just directing. I'm also, maybe you don't know that, but I'm also the producer of my films, which makes me also being relaxed financially, of course, because I'm not paying the nice furniture of other producers. Studios, it's my own. And of course, War Photographer was very successful. It's a classic, I made a lot of money, so it makes me more comfortable. I can be sometimes a little bit lonely in my work also because I'm not always having all these people around me, not always, like when I'm editing, I have an assistant constantly, I like that. When I'm shooting, of course, but this is a rare moments. But this loneliness, I also have to deal with it, you know, it's part of my concept and I'm ready to deal with it, actually. And I do also, uh, you know, I... Um, surround myself with young people now more and more, like Sue Moires, she's a um, director, I produce Raving Iran, it's a very successful film about two DJs in Tehran trying to do Deep House and techno, and there's some guys with beards, they have a problem with that, and that was a very successful thing, you, you can Google it, and um, so I'm beginning to be sometimes also a producer for other young people. And then um, one of the best experiences in last year's was the collaboration with Maxim Arbogaev. Because for the first time I worked with a co-director. He was 25 when we started. And uh, it was a wonderful collaboration. And the reason was because if you watch, and it's on Sunday, Genesis 2.0, it's shot partly on a very remote group of islands in the Arctic, in the Russian Arctic. And I have no access there as a, as a foreigner. So I had to reach out for a guy, and that ended up in a wonderful collaboration. Can you repeat the name? Of the guy, Maxim Arbogaev. You will see, because it's also, of course, it's in the film, you, it's, it's not, you don't have to wait for the credits to find out that we were two directors. It's a dialogue film, and... Um, wonderful, you know, to working. And he did cinematography and um, directing on this remote island. So Genesis 2.0 is a film about, it's a very, very challenging topic because on the one hand, you have the daily life of so-called mammoth tusk hunters. They are seeking for the tusks, you know, of the, of the mammoth and it's a living and it's, a, it's very male, a lot of testosterone, they are, you know, on these islands and and one day they find more than a tusk they find an entire carcass with blood and mammoth and then you there is geneticists coming into the film and our future it's about synthetic biology about the fact that they want to screen now all the dna of all life forms on the earth and this will be the next huge revolution so for the first time i did a film on the past and on the future in the one film uh, it, it's a very successful film again, so it's okay. I mean, we, 
we started again in Sundance and Maxim got best camera at Sundance. It's very nice. But a difficult one to edit, by the way, to bring these two worlds together. And also when I would, the filmmakers among you, you should really watch Genesis because uh, there is actually two very different methods also in filmmaking combined in this film. Because Maxim worked in the wonderful tradition of direct cinema on the islands. He was just embedded with these men, they, with his little camera, and he filmed constantly 200 hours of footage. I mean, the first thing I did, I, I hired a co-editor to cook this down to 30 hours. I never watched it. Because it would be, it, 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 would, it would kill all my libido. <laughs> no, I mean it. I, you get dead, you know, watching 200 hours. So I, I had a very good co-editor and he cooked it down. And me in the scientific labs, I, I couldn't use, of course, direct cinema at all. You can't go to a lab where there's a superstar geneticist giving you five hours of his lifetime. And you can't just go there and say, we are not even here. Just do whatever you want. It, it's the contrary. You have to actually do setups. So I, I use these methods, but I, we cannot go into that. I, use, I need much more time. I normally do uh, one or two days master classes because then I can tell you exactly how I try within a setup situation to again turn it around to a little bit at least of direct cinema style by surprising them in the last seconds, camera already running, for example, with little figurines of an elephant and a mammal, just putting it on the table. What are they doing? They take it into the hand to begin to speak. That's now in the film. Don't direct in a documentary by directing. Not even, I mean, not megaphone directing, but don't even direct. You direct by every single email you write them. That's directing. The way you appear into their lives, the, the way you, you create a relationship with your protagonist, that's directing. When there is the shoot, you are actually, that's, your work is done. You know, I'm somewhere sitting, I don't know, I hide. I also hate it. I love the first phase in filmmaking, the research and the editing. And then the, 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 the shoot is, is never as perfect as I want it, but it's surprising sometimes. It's okay, but it's not my... Because my work is not there. That's my cinematographer's work. It's like a farmer. You have to prepare the field. That's our job. So, for example, also when, when I did Sleepless in New York, how do you film the nights of somebody who is just being left by his loved one, one-sided, you know, this classical situation. Sorry, you know, have a good time or a good life, bye-bye. And the, the fact that sometimes love sickness is, is really one of the most incredible feelings we ever have in our life. I mean, that you're constantly ruminating about this person, you can't let go. How do you film that? You cannot go to the, you know, with the film crew to New York and then you surround this poor girl with, in the bed and you tell her, you're now alone. I mean, give me a break. So if you watch Sleepless in New York, you see how I did it. I used Skype. She has a computer like you all have. She was, she was Skyping anyway with her best friends in New York until 3 o'clock, everybody wanted to sleep. For me, it was 9 o'clock, Zurich, Skype record on, like a shrink, you know, recording the next six hours until she began to sleep in front of the Skype camera. Every night we recorded and the loneliness was not destroyed, but it's captured. How do you scout, how do you find somebody if you want to cover love sickness, heartbreak. And I wanted, I'm sorry to use this term, but that's an answer also to your question. I wanted somebody fresh, freshly left. So we needed an entire huge system, which I built up for weeks and months to finally I captured the third night of somebody um, who just was, you know, ready to to be in the film in this, in this kind of feelings. You have to prepare that. So it's 
as you can see, in every film I made other decisions. We created not only for war photographer, we created special cameras also in Sleepless in New York. We created a camera which is combining two angles in the same frame. Angles. I'm not speaking about the zoom lens. It's always one angle, no, at the time. This lens is, it's actually not a lens, it's a mirror. So we went to the subway in New York and you see a normal face and then it begins to be more and more wide angled, which distanced this face from all the other people. Six months of development in Germany. They told me first it's not even working, it worked. And so I like this stuff. I do technical stuff, as you can see. But don't ask me about where, what camera I used actually now with Genesis, what Maxim used. It's not so important also. And it's another danger when you are beginning. You probably hide too much behind the Alexa just because you want to protect your biggest fear, which is what do I have to tell and how do I tell my story? And it's not so much about the, the camera sensor's size. I mean, it's nice to have these choices you can have now. Okay, are you tired? Yeah. I know. Yeah. No, I mean, I, don't, I have no idea how long should this be. I mean, they were probably hungry, no? Oh, you tell me. I don't want to... Huh? Well, I'm here for you. But you, if you are hungry, you can also leave, you know, I mean, but uh, I don't want to... Let me know how much. And if you, also, if you want to come back for the screenings, I will be always at the Cineteca. Every screening begins now from today on, every day at 7.30. And I'll be there afterwards. So you can also, we can continue sometimes um, after the screenings at Cineteca. So should we take a last question? Because they are tired, look at them. I, I read body language, come on. <laughs> What's going on? And the photographer, do you... You mean James Nackway or my cinematographer? Me, in general, me. I mean... You mean the cinematographer do you actually or the... The DP, do you oh, actually train okay. him no, to... How to... Uh, they get a relationship with the, with the people as well, and you sit in the corner, as you said, or how do you work? Yeah, with it's, them? it's yes. a good question. Well, Peter Indegant, you know, he is the guy doing all six features. So if you want to watch all the films this week, you have always one name at the end in the credits. It's always in a very important name. It's Peter Indergand. It's the brother I never had. I grew up with three sisters. Now, Peter is very important for me because he, I mean, we just, it's the recipe maybe for our success is also him because Yes, my work is done when we shoot. I mean, he's most of the time alone. Again, back to Sleepless in New York, you know, we were also finally shooting normally with this girl, you know, and we, we, we took a situation. She's a florist. She has to prepare the, the, the flowers for the wedding of her best friend, being lovesick herself. Mm. Good situation, no? Do you get my instinct? It's important. This is not cruel to do it. It's my topic, by the way. And she agreed. Now, how to film that? Because now it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the night, you know. But Peter was alone with her for an entire day. She, her doing the, the flowers for the wedding of her best friend. And of course, there was tears, there was everything. She slept for two hours with Peter in the same room on the sofa. He was just there. And she told me later on, He's like a panther. I don't, he came so close, I didn't feel it. <clears throat> it's all about, you. if you do cinematography in documentary, you have to know about our primitive parts of our brain. You have to know what it means when somebody's staring at you. This is, this is built in, you know. You have to know about distance, body language, everything. This is the key to good pictures. So it's beyond all the technique you use. This is the key moment. You have to anticipate emotions. Otherwise, you just have the backs of people. You have to be in front of the action in real situations which you can't destroy, which most of the time are just once of a time 
they're happening once. You have to get it. So Peter is just very intelligent. <laughs> Sorry, he mean he he is very good in that. He does all this technical stuff, by the way, but he reads the emotions, he reads the situation, and he's very. I don't know how he's doing it because he's, for example, he's very tall. You know, he's not small. He's and me in this situation with this love lorn girl doing the flowers for the wedding. Uh, the sound, uh, my assistant, me, and uh, the sound girl, woman, uh, sitting just in the bedroom, door closed the entire day, and catering coming, and I watched all the footage by, you know, remote monitor. I could hear everything, so that I was not in the same room. It is important how many people you have in a room. This is, uh, it's, I mean, I wouldn't call it a set, what we are, you know, when we work. It's not a set. I mean, unless you do a documentary in a studio, you can try that too. But we are guests in real people's <coughs> kingdoms. I mean, like, you know, working offices, they are there and you are a guest and you better behave. But that doesn't mean that you are too shy also. Because finally you end up being like James Nachtway here respectfully here and not you know compromise tripod machine camera you you have a responsibility but you 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 do it you know you go close if you feel now it's the moment if it's too early then you might destroy it if it's too late then it's too late it's hard to say you know but uh, peter is um, is wonderful and um, He's also, of course, part now of the whole process. You know, when we do love sickness, he, we, 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 we work for days together and we develop these special cameras and we, we do a concept for the entire film, how we, f we are going to film it. I think, you know, I was also in, in, in Poland, there's one, you might know it, there's one festival dedicated to the art of cinematography. It's a camera image and they, they give awards to the cinematographers and the DOPs and the, the best ones are coming. I, I, I'm sure the Mexican superstar cinematographers are going there. They're, they're all there at the place called Big Dosh or something at the end of, the, somewhere in end of the world in, in Poland. And it's really interesting if you have the big stars and they all have these Alexa boxes, you know. I mean, they don't talk about it. They talk about the old photo lens with that and that texture they put on the Alexa. Because the problem you have now with your super cameras, there's no texture anymore. Look at war photographer, these tiny cameras. They have a nice texture, I love it. It's a very organic texture. GoPro is a horrible texture, horrible. And of course, when I worked, began to work with Maxim, you know, for the islands, for Genesis 2.0, he wanted to bring the gimbal and the GoPro and the, what is this flying thing, the, the drone. <laughs> nope, neither of it. Please hear. I, I, I wrote him a, a poem-like email about heart, relationship, approach, not Riefenstahling, you know, not this kind of perspective. Please, it's, you express yourself and uh, drones are, why should all of a sudden you should turn into an eagle in a documentary? Because in a fiction film, you would give a shit about how they did it. I mean, look at action movies. They use whatever tools and it might be fascinating. I'm okay. But it's not, you are in God's, I, you know, you just see the action. You don't care how it's done. This is different in documentary because you express yourself. It's situations where it's too perfect, like the gimbal, like a steady cam. You don't walk in front of a real human being walking in front. Like, where should this poor person look at? It's not an actor for getting out the steady cam, you know, and the cold lens here. You don't film real people when they have nothing to do and no emotions. Don't do it. Because, you know, what should I do if I 
have nothing to do and then is a film crew here just filming me, then uh, you, it's not comfortable. You film when they are in a situation. Yeah. Um, you already mentioned some of it, but I'm curious to hear more specifically about um, maybe... Um, other um, conflicts that you have in terms of your role, your responsibility towards your protagonists or the stories that you want to tell? I'm interested in more yeah. um, challenging situations. This is the first question. And the second question... Maybe wait with the second, because then I can... Because it's a big one, no, the first. Well, I could talk for hours. I mean, every good documentary has to reduce the complications and the complexity of the real. You know, finally, most of our creative documentaries are based on this tradition of storytelling. A good story is a reduction of complexity, always. You don't understand your own world even sometimes because you hide be behind too much. Oh, it's, you know, you tell your best friend shaking you when you are in a crisis. No, no, it's much more complicated. And then you realize later on, actually, she was right by reducing my complications, by this cathartic message she gave to me. It's like that and that and that. And that's our role in society. You reduce the complications to open up. It's about truthfulness, Werner Herzog, and not about facts. That's an answer because of protagonists, because they have to learn that it's not about their entire universe of complexity or their life. And they do. They love you for that. As a good friend, you might love her or him shaking you, you know, like trying to go to an inner truth or a, 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 a core of, of some life storyline. I never had any conflicts with my protagonist after the filming. I had with James Nachtway, it is normal that it happens also during the filming, but they're all fine and uh, that's important because then, you know, now also, I don't know how it is here, but we, we have too many contracts now in, in Europe at least and in, in US, it's, it's this uh, agreement stuff which I think it's very difficult because the agreement first of all has to be a human one, that they trust you and that you take on this responsibility, which is, it is, you know, it is a big responsibility. Is it an answer to what, what was, yeah? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Second. Second one, maybe, maybe you cannot speak about that, but you were saying about this epiphany that you're having in terms of when you choose a topic. I imagine that's very intuitive, but I'm curious about your analysis of these moments or what is it that, is there a, some commun common um, aspects of topics or issues that really grab you and that define you as a documentary filmmaker? No, but just, I mean, sometimes it's just obvious, you know. Again, I'm just repeating myself, but it's very simple. If I hear from a Cuban woman that she wants to leave the paradise her father was fighting for and that he was the founder of one radio station and she's listening to the other and you have actually these four, you know, two persons and two radio stations, of course I had the epiphany. I didn't know then it was an epiphany because it was just, wow, this is a film. Why? Because it is the very seldom moment where you anticipate a story which is still to unfold. And if you're doing a good job, you can actually grab it. So it's very simple. Much more difficult now, let's take Genesis. The epiphany came when I was reading a book about synthetic biology, not with the intention to do a film, but it's just a, you know, it's a big topic. I'm interested in science. I read a lot. And an entire chapter in this book was dedicated to the resurrection of the woolly mammoths. You know, we want to bring back the woolly mammoth to life. You know, woolly mammoth has this nice reputation now because of Ice Age movies. You know, nobody wants a dinosaur back because we have seen Jurassic Park, but we <laughs> love Ice Age. So, yeah, now it's great to bring back the woolly mammoth. And I read this, this, this chapter and I came across uh, photos by um, an, a Yakutian photographer showing the incredible world of people making a living out of seeking for tusks. And it's related to this resurrection because the more of these people seek the, for the ivory, the better is the chance that they actually find the carcass and the blood and the DNA which the geneticists need. So this was the epiphany. But then, you know, I mean, 
I cannot, this is more a Q&A than a masterclass, but you know, either you have a story with an inner conflict already, so the gasoline is built in, like Ricardo Mirimi Fidel, huh? it's, it's obviously conflict. He has to deal with the fact that he, she, she leaves. Or you have this kind of conflict which you build by contrast, like Genesis 2.0. You have the primordial world of this, it looks like our past, you know, like God, hunters, gatherers, these people seeking for the tusks. And then you have this futuristic world of the labs. So this is a contrast. It's also kind of a conflict. But you always have to have some form of contrast or conflict, otherwise you are really lost. I mean, I've never heard of... Again, you know, it's like the wedding. If it's uh, yes on both sides, it's nice. And it's most of the time like that, then it's a private video. We need more. We, you know, we don't want to go to the movie theater to watch happy people. I mean, it's just not storytelling. It doesn't say so much about our world. Yeah, well, you, I think it's okay. So I hope to see uh, at least some of you at my screenings. Uh, and you are always welcome then to approach me after. Don't be shy. Learn that from me too. I'm actually very shy. You might not notice it, but I'm deep inside it's not true. I'm not so much a showman. I just had to learn. But um, yeah, see you and good luck with your work. Bye. <laughs> Bye.